All right, so I understand we're live and welcome to the very last of our Zoom sessions this year. And I've um, got a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Um, but first of all, just, just want to just recap the year, really. Uh, we started out, we um, uh, um, Travis and I were talked about introducing the uh, hand tools special interest group at the very first um, very first uh, general meeting that we didn't have so we agreed to go ahead and do it on zoom and i've certainly had a great time doing it and it's given me you know some days when i've got nothing else to do I, i've had you know been able to sit and think about what we're doing here but um you know and we're, we're ending the year on i think a good note now and uh I'm hoping that with the with the vaccination that got approved yesterday, that we might be back in the shop in in, in a few months and might be able to do some in person meetings. You know, once we've got uh, a few months down the road there. But uh, you know, I feel that like for San Diego Fine Woodworkers, it's been a challenging year, but it's been a, a, a good year, and and I think it's it's helped to strengthen up uh, a lot of aspects of our program. So that that's kind of cool. Um, and I just want to um, say a big thank you to, to both Dallas and Lewis, who've been uh, through the year, have uh, done production, and uh, have made my life just a piece of cake. You know, all I have to do is show up and do my, my buffoonery, and, and away we go. So um, I, I, I do want to say a huge thank you for that. And um, then I'm just going to talk briefly about what we're doing today. Um, I, we, uh, one of the things we as woodworkers have to do, especially in this world of, of diminishing resources in terms of uh, nice white pieces of wood and so on, or even, um, uh, you know, like if you, if you uh, try to actually resaw a piece of wood this thick and, uh, and uh, then make it into one piece as a tabletop, it's just not going to work because usually as soon as you've resawn it, it bends nicely and so uh, you need to resource considerably larger than, than in terms of thickness than, than what you're going to achieve. And sometimes you have to saw the board in half, rearrange the uh, surfaces and, and join them back together. So this is actually three pieces of wood and I'm going to show you how to do that today with hand tools. So um, with that, what I'd really like to do is turn this over to um, David Weissman in Milwaukee, who is, uh, you know, has been, as you, many of you know, uh, comes out here during the early part of the year and spent some time here and, and, and did some instructing, uh, uh, you know, with our educational program this last, uh, um, this last January, February and March. And after the, the recent school, you know, turning an, a, a square post into an octagon and talking about tables and so on, David decided to go with it big time and he found a design which he's considerably modified, which is the secret to good design, if you ask me, is find a good design and then modify it to your taste. Um, and he found a good design and changed it to his taste and he's really taken the octagon theme uh, and run with it. So I want to turn it over now to uh, David. Thanks, Paul. Uh, everybody hear me okay? I'll assume, I'll assume you can. Uh, welcome to my shop. Welcome to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, I will be out in uh, San Diego the first week in January through uh, pretty much the end of March this year. Outdoor so, temperature uh, currently in Wisconsin? It is 34, raining, about to turn to sleet and snow. Egan. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Now it, is, now it is December, what, 11th or 12th now? We usually have, have had two or three snowstorms by now, but we've had no snow yet. So it's been a very mild winter. So, Sounds um, like it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, Paul is my hand tool guru. Um, and uh, we bonded last year when I was in San Diego. And a year ago, I clipped the design for this table out of uh, Fine Woodcraft, Fine Woodworking Magazine. Uh, and put it aside, but I knew I wanted to make it. And uh, after his last session, and he taught us how to hand carve octagons and legs, I said, okay, it's time to pull this out. Um, so I made this table and Paul has the, the plans and he can forward it to anyone. Uh, I sent it to him. 
Um, the basics of this are the legs are ash, uh, chosen because it's very straight grain. Um, the top is hickory, made up of three pieces uh, put together. Uh, the top has a, is, is cut in an octagon and then beveled at 45 degrees on the sides, if you can appreciate that, with about a, um, I can't remember, about a three quarters of an inch straight lip and then it's 45 degrees underneath. And then the legs are uh, octagons uh, tapered at both ends, uh, one end to fit into the top and one end is the legs. The original plan called this for this to have turned legs, I don't mean turn, excuse me, um, uh, bent, steam bent the bottom six inches of the leg with a little turn out. But I'm, I'm kind of like, that's, I didn't really want that. I like the straight look. Uh, we have a lot of uh, furniture in our house that, that would not fit well. Um, and then two cross stretchers, which are, which start out as five eighths inch blanks. And uh, it's all, um, and all the leg parts were done, I did by hand uh, with um, the tools that um, Paul has shown us. Uh, draw knife, which you really didn't need a draw knife, but I like to use it because it's a lot of fun. Uh, block plane, spoke shave, and a uh, regular finishing plane. And uh, once I figured out how to hold the wood, which was its own challenge, uh, I, to do the octagons, what I ended up doing is coming over to my bench, which is over here, which I made a number of years ago, and used this tail vise and uh, put the wood in the tail vise and then put a um, roller stand underneath it, which I could adjust the height. And that worked just perfect for me to do all the carving on by hand. Um, so that, that worked out really well. Um, the legs, the, the uh, legs are stained with India ink and then a lacquer finish on top, a spray lacquer to seal it in. And the top has a, uh, uh, just a plain oil finish, which I'm, a tongue oil varnish finish, several coats on it. And uh, the inserts for the tenons uh, to lock them in was uh, with some walnut uh, wedges at eight degrees that I cut. So that's the table. Um, Paul knows that last year when we met, we had both made the same stool. Uh, although if you look at Paul's, it's a lot more classy than mine. But uh, that was my, this was my first attempt at building a stool and uh, came out reasonably well. It was pretty hard. Uh, but this, uh, this went much smoother. Um, so uh, happy to answer any questions, um, comments. David, uh, Doug here. Uh, hey, Doug. What, what is your diameter or your material width for your legs? Those, uh, well, I, you know, you, I just finished it last week and I can't remember. So they are an inch, about an inch and an eighth. And then an eighth, inch and an eighth. Okay, thank yeah. you. And, and I think and you did they, make them octagon. Yes, you, can't, you, you know, I've realized that once I stain them black, you can't see the octagons. So they are in octagons. Right, right, you can see right. it. And okay, uh, I use, I could see that now. Yeah, yep. I used Paul's method of, uh, with a scribe to scribe the lines. And I got to say, it worked incredibly well. Uh -huh. So, and then the stretcher has a half lap on it. Great. Um, for the joinery there. Okay. Now, doing octagons. Oh, you answered my these, last question. Yeah, the stretchers also call for octagons, but I got to tell you, doing octagons in wood that's a five eighths inch blank was pretty tough. So uh, there's more of a suggestion of octagons. Um, yeah, gotcha. I uh, <laughs> was not, you know, that was tough. Sure. Thank you for sharing. You bet. Hey, you mentioned did, did the entire uh, table surface. Uh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Did you do the entire table surface with hand tools as well, or did you actually use something like a router in that process? No, no router. Um, what I used the plan, I did what the guy said in the plan, which was to cut the octagons and then cut the 45 degree uh, edge on a, a bandsaw. In oh. retrospect, I would not have used a bandsaw. I would have done it all with a hand plane because it was too hard to hold. And I got wavy, very wavy, which I had to then work yeah, double yeah. hard with a hand plane to get all the waves out. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, he has a nice picture in the plan of him holding it at the bandsaw, and I thought, well, okay, I'll try that. No, oh, didn't work well at all. Hey, David, once upon a time, there was something in the middle of your basement floor there that you've been walking yes. across. It was, was it? it was a furnace. It was a furnace. 
uh, the furnace is now over there at the other side Got of the it. workshop. That was before we moved in. Got there it. used to be a there used to be a coal fired furnace down here. Oh wow! With a coal chute, the house is about a hundred years old. Okay. Only the en only the engineer in the group would pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is the Indian ink stain a standard product? It is. Well, you can buy Indian ink anywhere. And it, I turned out a friend of mine who's a woodworker had a bottle, half a bottle left. And um, he, he had used it and had raved about it. So I wanted to try it. And it, it is so easy to use. Um, you just stain it on and, you know, ap ap apply it on, let it dry for 24 hours. Oh, no. And then you, you, you do need to cover it with something, um, either shellac or um, a lacquer. Otherwise, you know, my wife would not have been happy if she rubbed up against it and got ink on her pants. So, <laughs> thank they, you. They have eight ounce bottles at uh, Hobby Lobby. There you go. Bill. Good, thanks, Doug. At yeah. a very reasonable price. The uh, the picture in the plan had the entire thing black, um, the top too, but I didn't want. I, I like the wood color much better. Yeah, I loved. I had never worked with hickory before, and I ended up getting some, and it was just. It, I really, it's beautiful. Beautiful grain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't I can't thank uh, Paul enough for his guidance on this. Uh, he really uh, gave me the confidence to go ahead and try this. And I, I, I know um, you don't understand this, but um, it, it's uh, it, it, it's it's just a joy doing the work by hand. I, I it's so much more satisfying than running it through a machine for me. So Anyway, I'll turn David, it back to you, Paul. Uh, because, oh, yeah. Uh, David, quick question. Because yeah. it was hickory and you kind of uh, hit ingrain with your plane, did you find <laughs> that you had to sharpen more <laughs> um, because of the dense hardwood? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you have an octagon, you end up having six of the eight sides you're doing ingrain. And um, yeah, that was a bit of a pain. Um, yeah, I probably had to sharpen more. But you know, you just keep working at it, and it, it, with the plane, it worked its way out. Uh, but yeah, that was fun. The, what was interesting was on the legs. I didn't have very much trouble with the grain switch that Paul spent a lot of time teaching about on this ash wood, and I'm not sure why. Um, but it, it only on one of the legs was it even sure. a suggestion of a problem, where you had to switch <laughs> your uh, spoke shave to go the opposite direction. So I don't understand that. Maybe you maybe you can teach me, Paul. I I, I think it's mo oh hang on yeah you're, you're on yeah I have, you're on. I, I'm unmuted. I think it's mostly about the quality of the wood. Some woods seem to uh, are much more grainy than others, and yeah, and and also you might have just got a, a, a nice cut through the wood. I'm not sure. Yeah, could be. Yeah, uh, but it was so uh, having that straight grain, no knots, no no bends, it was just made it so easy to, to uh, carve by hand. It would have been much harder with a, uh, a more difficult wood. Yeah, I love ash. It's, it's really nice to work with. And, and uh, that hickory is gorgeous as well. Kind of hard though, isn't it? <laughs> um, are you talking about the, ish, the hickory or the ash? <laughs> the hickory. Uh, the hickory was, was tough to plane. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Tough to plane. Yeah. And the surface of it is interesting. It's it's uh, almost got like a fiber quality to it. Um, yeah. That was uh, difficult for me to sand smooth. Um, so, but got there mostly. Cool. I think it's beautiful, David. I think it's just beautiful. Thanks, Paul. Okay, Paul, back to you. Teach us something. Oh, well, before you go, David. Yeah. You know, you've given us just a little tease. Would you mind taking us with a, a whistle stop tour of your shop? Oh, absolutely. Please. So we'll start, up, uh, we'll start over at the bench. I, I went to a woodworking class at Mark Adams Woodworking a few years ago, and they had benches of this style. And so I found a plan online and uh, made this bench um, out of uh, the top is three inch maple. I'm reasonably happy with it. Um, I I don't know if this is the same for everybody, but it didn't rotate when you rotated. We're looking at your bench. Sorry. There yeah, you're looking at a bench. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, oh, should I leave it like this then? Yeah. I think that so, works. yes. Okay, this is a bench. 
Um, and that's where I do, you know, all that stuff. Um, about 10 years ago, I bought, I upgraded from my Sears to a quarter cable table saw. And a few years later, I added on a sliding, sliding side to it. Um, nice. Over here is our furnace, my short wood storage cabinets. And then uh, two years ago, I bought the uh, Rikon um, bandsaw. And this year, my big purchase was the Powermatic joiner. Oh, no. um, I did a lot of uh, this all during the pandemic. I uh, was building furniture for friends. Uh, basically, I had a little, wasn't a business because I only charged them for the wood. But I was building furniture and I was building lots of big furniture. And I just, my little joiner just didn't cut it. I had a 70 year old Delta joiner that just wasn't big enough. So I, I splurged and bought this. Uh, but to buy this, I needed to make more space in my shop. So I built this uh, reversible cart with my uh, sander on top and my uh, uh, planer underneath, and it flips over. So that was a fun look. David, yeah. I've, I've seen these things, just because I'm always concerned with space, I've seen these things in, in project plans. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, how practical is it for you to flip it? Totally. Does it is it an easy to do process? Totally. It takes just a second. Yeah. Wow. Uh, if I had somebody to hold the phone, I'd show you. But basically, if you look here, Mr. Engineer, there are four, <laughs> four, four little knobs. Yeah. The knobs come out. Oh, they swivel to the front. They swivel oh, okay. to the front and the back, and the thing flips over, and you're done. Mm. Wow. It's, it's very, good. it's very slick. Now, the downside to this is I used to have these both out for full access all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. So when you want to use them, it's a little more complicated. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Uh, dust collection system, which I redid this year, because again, the joiner, a jet, uh, del jet, uh, drill press. I, my ceiling is too short for any of the large standing drill presses. I can't. I just can't get it in the ceiling here. Uh, this is a. Uh, work cart that I built out of some plan two years ago that I just love. It's the best part of my shop. Mm. I just, it does everything. And this year I added on an extra extending table. And then, you know, a, uh, what do you call it? Chop saw and then my sharpening sanding station over here underneath the TV and a lathe, which I got a few years ago. And my uh, Younger son has been home with us for a couple of weeks. And so I've been teaching him how to make bowls on the lathe. And that's been a lot of fun. That's the shop. My, uh, so how much here. of a challenge was it to get that joiner down yeah. into the basement? Yeah. Um, much less than I expected. And I really? got to tell you, um, so my, and the biggest problem is if you notice here, my off, my stairs are offset from yeah. the door and the top <laughs> door of the basement is only 26 inches wide, which is thus the limit on any woodworking project I have. Yep. Um, but getting that down here with a friend was not as nearly as hard as I thought it was gonna be. Um, we okay. brought it down in, you know, in two pieces and we used this top and we massaged it over and no fingers were lost. Good, so good. I, I take that as a positive. Yeah. Hey, Doug, will you, you bring your jointer down in your elevator? Uh, um, Ele yes, but I, <laughs> like David, I have to take the, I have to take one of the infeed tables off to get it even to fit in the elevator. <laughs> wow. Oh, you and have like your house David, built with I, an elevator? I, I'm sorry? You had your house built with an elevator? Uh, no, I actually installed it after I built the house. They wouldn't uh, do it while they were building the house. But like David, I have a width constraint of 35 inches. Oh, I'd kill for 35 inches. Right. I, I'd kill for 30 inches. I, there was a, uh, <laughs> there's that Michael Fortune chair I just love that you can see all over the place. And it's, I, I got the plans and then realized I'll never get upstairs. <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. So yeah, uh, those are the limits of the, the, the woodworking. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, David, for sharing. You bet. Hey, thanks, guys. Thank you, David. That's that's really neat. And I, I'm going to make that piece, I think. 
All right. Oh, we're back to me. Okay. I was looking at the screen, which froze. Okay. So, um, I, I'm uh, playing with some ideas about, uh, you know, classes on video and so on as, as, as part of my involvement with the education department. So, I'm a uh, uh, present. What our intro class has a stool. Um, this is what the students make, it, or something very close to it. Is a little stool that they, they uh, learn the basics of, of, of woodwork. And in order to um, to get the width here, we usually buy sapelli because you can buy it in wide widths, and we make it we make it ten inches wide, so they don't have to glue it. But my FedEx guy asked me to make one, so. Um, I'm, I, I'm in the process of making one and using it as an educational tool, but I, I, the maple I had was only seven inches wide. So I glued, I butt glued this together. And um, as you can see, it, it, it covers it up reasonably well. And, um, and uh, you know, I've, got, I've got the rest of it. I'm, it's funny, David, you mentioned uh, oil finish. I'm on 300, uh, 320 sandpaper on this with the oil finish, and you're absolutely right. It's going to need. I'm using Liberon, and it's still going to need something over the top of it. So, um, I but a neighbour saw me making that one. <laughs> Guess what I'm doing for my neighbour? So the first part of it is taking the maple and gluing the two pieces together. So I've cut this a little longer than 15 inches. So my first suggestion is, if you're doing something like this, allow yourself a couple of inches extra at each end, because um, somehow the ends will, uh, they're a bit more vulnerable to, to um, not being, um, not being uh, straight. Um, so, uh, Lost my, lost my train of thought there. Yeah, so anyway, the whole key to joining these together is to create an absolutely square um, and flat, completely flat surface here. Because the way that uh, Type 1 glue works best, or most glues work best, is with a very, very, very small gap between the bonding surfaces. So what we want is to perfectly square and um, straight and uh, smooth surfaces with which we're going to glue up. So um, what we have to do with that is to plane, plane these edges. So I'm working, I'm not, I'm not starting that with rough wood. This is wood, wood I bought at TH and H and you know, these two pieces are out of the same plane. And I feel, uh, you know, the first thing I do when doing this is I'll look at my edges and I'll play around with them to see which, which grains, why don't we move into reasonably close up, which grains will go together and show the line the least. So I'll play around look at all of the surfaces and very often you can find something that looks reasonably similar. Um, in this case, I'll, I'll just keep turning until I find something. You've got to look at color, you've got to look at grain, and sometimes you just can't do anything about what you've got and you just have to go ahead with it. But you still need to make a really good, um, clean surface here so that we can glue. So, let me see, that, that looks okay. That doesn't. So you just play around until you find something that works. That looks like it's prob probably, this looks like my best grain, but to do that, I'd have to go and saw a little bit off of this fuzzy edge. You can see that one edge of the, what I bought at TH and H, one edge of it is kind of rough looking. And so we're gonna, I would need to plane in this case a full quarter inch because there's a, a little uh, chip off of the edge there. So I'm not gonna, for this purpose, I'm not gonna pick what I think would be the perfect one. Although, <laughs> again, if I left this on the underside, sorry, if I left this little waned edge there on the underside, 
it wouldn't matter. And I'm probably, I'm going to be taking off a corner here anyway. So those are all things to consider when you're, you're, you're joining this. No, I'm not going to be taking a corner off there. I was wrong, sorry. So I'm going to pick two surfaces that I can join together and it will be sort of good. Maple's a hard one to get there because it's, uh, it has color changes, very fine grain and a, um, and these fairly clear um, markings here. But so we're going to go with that. So the first thing I'm going to do is to put a carpenter's, a carpenter's, a woodworker's triangle on there so that I know which surfaces I'm going to join. Because I tell you, once I separate these two, I will forget, um, I will forget uh, which surfaces I'm joining. So the, I, I want to get one of them really straight. So I'm going to put it in the vise. This is nice because my piece goes all the way to the bottom of the vise and I don't have to worry about holding it quite as hard as I do otherwise. Okay, so this will be on the bottom side so it's not gonna be too much of a problem. Okay, so I'm gonna start by grabbing my tools. The tools I'm gonna use are a number four plane. If you're using, if you're trying to work a piece that's longer, with a bigger plane. The word plane refers to a flat surface, to planing, to, to you know, creating a plane. So your tool is what keeps the wood straight. So if you're working with a piece of wood, like David was, sometimes you're cutting cross grain and um, having this flat plane, long flat plane is really helpful to get that. Um, also for long edges, Similarly, you can, you know, for so if this was three or four feet wide, then I can run the jointer along the entire piece. And as I work it a few times, the joint is going to actually help to create, because it's not going to ride up over the humps that are already exist here. So the first thing I'm going to do is just check roughly for straightness here. Yeah. So I'm just using a, a ruler. If you've got a good straight edge, then that's fine. Looks like it's dropping off a little at that end. And it's hard to do in artificial light, but you should have a light the other way. But I can see it's clearly dropping down at that end. So that's something to consider. I may end up taking off this little bit anyway. And the other thing, what's my little square? had a really small one. The other thing I want to look at is, is it, aha, this is the square that I find really the best for doing this work because very often you are down, way down in the uh, vice here. And what I want to do is just take a look and see how square it is. So I have to get my eye down with, preferably with a light source about where you guys are. Um, and with my glasses on, I can see that's reasonably good. The way I use the square is I put the, the face, one of, I can't remember the names of the parts of it, put this face and drop it down. I gotta keep this square, this square, it's very easy to get a, a, you know, to hold it like that slightly off. So always, again, use the surface that you put the carpenter's triangle on and go along. Okay, so this piece is reasonably square as it is. So my job using the plane is of course to put it off square <laughs> because I'm a human being, but I'll try not to. So what I'm gonna do is the first thing I'm gonna do is look and see, look on the side and see which way the grain looks as if it's going. It can fool you. So I've looked at the side and it looks like I have to Put this round. It's not so obvious here. Yes, it is. You see, there's more of the grain coming upwards towards the face, this edge than there is going the other way. And very often you'll have switches in the grain. So I'm going to switch that round and you can see again, the grain's tending to go up into this surface. It's not perfect throughout, but I'm probably going to get a better um, planing surface. Initially, this is by my standards fairly rough because it's come through a circular saw. There are still little bridges and so on. So I'm going to use this old plane for which I have a story, of course, and I'll relate that shortly. 
just run that plane along here. It's currently set on a very fine setting. I'm gonna open that up a bit by adjusting the dial here. It's, well, it's not really dial. I'm cutting very thin cuts because I want to start thin and then work down. And eventually I hit a sweet spot. It depends on the roughness. You can see I'm beginning to get shavings there. All right, that feels like it's smooth all the way. What I'm looking for is as I go along here, I'm not, I'm concerned with the squareness, but I'm gonna dial that in in a bit. The important thing is what I'm looking for with my final strokes with this plane is to see a full width shaving the full length of the piece. Not quite getting that. A few more. It's kind of, you can see, because it's the thin shaving, it's breaking up, but it is actually going the full width. I'm gonna just check my plane. When you're checking plane blades, by the way, it really helps to have a light surface behind. So I'll use a piece of paper usually, just have it floating around on my bench. And yes, can you see that the blade, the blade is going slightly up that side. So I'm going to adjust that. It's a very, very slight. There we go. That might give me a better. It's beginning to get better. I'm going to actually take a little more heavy cut. All right, that looks like I may have it at least smooth along here. First thing to do is to check that I really have it flat. Looks pretty close to flat to me, but it's, there's a slight gap there. I don't have anything yet. You can see I can actually insert a ruler under that end, which I can't do at this end. So I've got a little, little bit more to take off. A slightly heavier cut, take a bit more wood off with each cut. All right, let's take a look at that. Still a gap down that end there. It's not so obvious because I've taken a little off. By the way, if you have a ruler like this, you know you can buy those ones, they're a little bit more, they have cork on the back, they, they help you not to slide around. If you use blue tape, it costs you nothing. You use your existing rulers, and for marking with a knife or whatever, it really helps the grip. Plus the blue tape's not as stiff as the cork, so it's easier to get a knife close to the edge. All right, so I'm gonna do this a little more. If I have real problems with the end dropping, use a longer plane. That's still got a slight gap there. Looks like there's a hump in the middle here. There's a gap here, and there's a gap here. So I'm thinking there's a hump in the middle. When I'm getting close like this, use a pencil a lot. I mark roughly where I think I should take the wood off, and then I'll just use the plane on that little bit. Once my pencil mark is gone, then I look again. And we're back to not having a hump anymore, but there's still a drop at that end. This is where it really helps to have a couple of big extra inches because if that drops in the last inch, then don't worry about it. But I have a tendency to go over the edge too much weight on the front end, and that's the, what I've got to watch for. So I'll transfer my pressure more from a balance between the two to the back end. Oops. Uh, 
and even take the plane off before it gets there. So an accident. Uh, it's getting better. Not by any means perfect. Again, it's a hump in the middle. So again, what I saw was a hump around here. So you'll find when you're looking for light through a ruler like this, it, it's amazing what one or two shavings will do. Okay, that's somewhat close. We'll start working on the other one. So that's one side. And I'll work on this. So again, my carpenter's triangle or woodworker's triangle is here. So I know that's the place I wanna be looking at. And looking at grain, looks like it's gonna plane best away from me. Fairly straight, a little straighter that side than the other set, than the other one was. So, you know that the guys that mill this stuff don't check the squareness of their blade every few seconds. You can see as I plane this, some parts are planing, others aren't because of the slight. Still rough at this end, so I've got to take it down at this end. It's rough at the beginning. Sometimes that's because of the way you're stuck. And if there's a problem, use the old angle of plane. And actually in this case, there's a bit of a grain change there. So as I plane it right here, it's very rough and then it goes smooth again. So if I really want that smooth, I'll have to plane that little bit the other direction. Whoops. When you're skewed like that, it's easy to, to uh, rock it around, so you have to break it. But again, we'll fine tune it. Okay, that's still got a little gap down that end. You can clearly see, so I'm gonna actually, it's getting a little hard to push there. So my, my blade may be getting dull, but I'm gonna dial that just a little bit back. And then there's a lot of slack in those standings. So you have to go back to, to, um, to where you feel the resistance. The reason I've gone to a thinner cut is because I feel I have more control. You know what I didn't do was the squaring part. Now that looks pretty straight. I'm having a hard time seeing any light through that. So that's really nice as it is. Now we've got that. We've got a planed edge here. I wouldn't normally do this at this spot, but I'll just show you because this is another way to gauge whether you're getting somewhat close, is you put the one on top of the other. First of all, if it rocks, if there's any problems like that, then you know you've got to, you're not perfect. And I'm not. The other thing is you look at the end and you see how straight is that. So if I look from the end grain here, here, if you come around here with this, you look at that, you can, no, look, look along the, there you go, perfect. You can see that that's not perfectly flat. So one of those planes is ever so slightly out of plane. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I've got a phone call coming in on my hearing aids, so <laughs> I'm gonna try and, I think that's cut it off. I'll take them out, that's the easiest thing to do. <laughs> Can't talk and have a phone ringing in my head. Oh. All right, that's the story of my life. All right, so in the next spot, next thing I've got to do 
having checked those, those are looking okay. And if it doesn't matter to me, because whenever you do this, you, you make it thicker than what you want anyway. So if it doesn't matter to me, I might be willing to tolerate that little bit of out of square root. But to get a good glue bond, I really want it to be square. So again, I'm gonna go back and look at this. I can see it's square there. It's square there. It's a little, yeah. you can see a very slight gap here. It's beginning around here. So I'll put myself a little pencil mark here, which I'll show you in a minute. And I come on back, I come on back, and I come on back. And what I'm finding is that all along this edge here is out of square, ever so slightly. This edge, I'll double check it because if one part's square, and the other isn't. I don't always trust my vision. I'll double check it. If necessary, I'll put a powerful light about where you guys are. And now, now that I'm moving on to squaring it, I'm going to use a block plane. If you're going to buy one single plane, a block plane is, is, is the best thing to buy. You could, I could do all of this with this block plane. It's just easier and less hard work if you do it with a with a regular plane. So with this, I've also got some control. So I'm just gonna run the block plane along this one edge here. First of all, I'm gonna check my blade, check that it's lined up. It's not quite, this is not the usual hammer I use. What I'm looking for when I look down here with a white, behind is a very, very, very tiny dark line where, I, where my blade is coming through. And I always go for the smallest I can get and then go heavier as I need to. But, uh, and I wanna make sure that it's level, of, you know, a nice even thickness along that tiny line there all the way across. And that tells me my plane is, is lined up. And it's a pretty small, Pretty close. What can you do about that tear out? Tear out on the edge here? Yeah. Well, you've got a change of grain here. So if you're being really persnickety, then you, what you would do is you would, you, having worked this side, you, you'd avoid this and then work, work back like that. Mm. So you see that's now spooked there. And if I had worked that like that, then, then I would have the edge. But the other thing is, if I, this is, somewhat close to seven eighths, less than seven eighths. It's a little over three quarters of an inch. As long as I get a five eighth piece out of it, then I'll be happy. Um, I, because this is maple and it's really good. I think you can see uh, that it, it, maple does have these grain changes. It just does, which when you put a nice finish on it, gives you the, some beautiful chateaux and stuff like that. So. The very thing that when people stain maple, they say it makes blotchy, makes it blotchy with a good finish, it's beautiful. Okay, so that's that one. I'll go back, check my squares again, check it again there, check it again. And if I've got a little hole on that, um, one thing you can do once your piece is made is just judiciously use a little epoxy with some sawdust in it. I buy a, a West product that's called a structural epoxy that you can add stuff in and it still retains its strength. Um, uh, so there, there are various things you can do. Um, okay, so we've got that reasonably square. So now I'm gonna go back to the other one. Make sure that it's the edge I want. Run my square along here. It's tedious, but once you get in the habit of it, little high there, once you get in the habit, it's perfect there. It's getting higher here, so I'll go a little wider there. Right. 
necklace, this entire edge here is a little high. So, again, making sure that I put it in the right way. See, almost all of that stuff has disappeared. So by the time I thickness plane that, it may be gone completely. Just one or two shapes and then check because it's so easy to go over and tip it over the other way. I'm just like that. But that's looking a little better. Still a little high there, still a little high there. So again, I don't always use a pencil, but it's really helpful when you start up because, you know, say your phone rings or you, you go take a sip of coffee and then you can't remember which way the camera was. Um, so, uh, and, and also when you've removed the pencil mark, you know you've moved a, a sort of very thin slice of wood. Okay, pencil mark still there up that end. Two slices, and this is for this plate quite a thick slice. Much better, not perfect, but much better. So this was the one that was causing things to go out of truth. So it's square there now, and it begins here. So I'm going to do two things. Now take one more shape, and I'm going to dial back the thickness a little bit more. If I dial it back so far that, oh, which, oh, that's the camera. If I dial it back so far that uh, it doesn't touch the wood, then I just start dialing back in again. You can tell when you've got a thin cut because it's, it, you, there's less resistance. And also the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the foot. You guys who haven't tried move, uh, not the, the foot, the movable toe, it's called. This is the way to get really thin cuts. Move your toe in as close as possible to the blade like that, because what happens is it limits your tear out, what you were talking about tear out as well, because the thinner the piece that can go through there, the thinner, the sooner it's gonna slice if it's against the grain. So this, this technique of, of, of getting really close, the um, planes like this, they have a frog, it's adjustable, you move it back and forth, it gives you the same action. But it, this I can do instantly. This takes a couple of minutes and then you have to check that the blade's still good. Whereas, uh, so the adjustable toe in a block plane or in any plane where you want to get fine shavings is really useful. So now I'm getting very, very fine shaving, maybe a little too. So I'll just go out a tiny bit. These lineals is very sensitive to movement in terms of when you're trying to get them. Still a little high on all the edges along here. So, another clue if you're, if you're cutting a big camber, as long as your plane is straight you'll find that you begin to get full width cuts here. So I'm only trying to be level on this one inch here. Almost. That's perfect there. But I move an inch there and there's a little gap. So I know I don't need to take my plane beyond this point. Still a little gap there. So again, pencil line along here. The other beauty about using a block plane for this is very often I find after I've planed with, the, with, with a smoothing plane or, or a jack plane that, that I've actually created canvas on going both ways. And using a pencil and a block plane, I can mark a camber there. If it then switches over to here and then back to here, I can mark it off and then just take that little bit off that I need to take off. So it's looking like there's just a little drop edge there. So I'm just gonna run the plane on the whole thing. 
And you can also do it in small increments. So I can go, can at least get one, a bit like many other things, once you've got something to register to. And that's good there. That's good there. That's good there. And that's good there. So let's give it the acid test as it were. Something doesn't seem quite right there, just from the feel of it. Usually, if there's no feeling of rocking, it has a kind of a snug feeling when you get it right. So, what you can't see from there is that this is really affecting me. In so much as if I were going for exactly that thickness, I've got gaps here. I can get it nice and straight, but then I'm gonna to have to take some thickness off. But let me put that back here. And you know, the only thing to do on that is to redo it. So I'm not going to keep you guys for too much longer because I want to tell you something else. I'm not going to glue it. Yeah, I'm going to go another five minutes. But do you guys get the general idea? So that the, that cross grain thing is 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 difficult. Is is you know something to deal with. Um, but the reason I ended up doing I used I I, I, I got myself a jointer fairly early on, and. Um, Got myself a jointer and uh, was using that. It was only six inches, and I found that I was uh, I was I was using it maybe once or twice a year. And it took several minutes to pull out, and then it made a hell of a mess because I don't have a, a, a great dust collection system, and this wasn't a design that had much. You know, it was fifty years old, <laughs> and um, and I eventually decided that I, I so really did edge jointing. Did uh, face jointing that I could, you know, when the shop opened, I could come here and do that. And so I focused in on on being able to do edge jointing at home, and it's it's made a world of difference because I can make you know make things take several pieces of wood, make a you know make a um, what you call it a cutting board if I like. Um, but I can really make like something like a tabletop like this. There are some there are some nuances and so on, such as as planing a slight hollow into it that, that some people do to stop the ends from splitting. I haven't had that problem as long as I get my, my actual faces to be really, really well together. So I, I'm close enough with this that I think 10 minutes work. I, 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 what I would probably do at this point, because I've got that unpleasant thing there, is I, would, I, would, I, I might even, if it was a real issue, I might even take a bandsaw, just give myself a brand new straight edge there because I've allowed extra here, and um, and take that out. Or I, I would look at this and think, well, I can either fill that with, with epoxy, or more than likely by the time I uh, take that down to five eighths, that's all going to be gone. Or what's left will be easily sanded. I'm not going to advocate always using a plane for a finish, but. Uh, Maple seems to work well. I finished this up with a, with a flame. Now I was preparing it for oiling, so I was going to sand it anyway. What I wanted to talk about was how you heard me talk, and you, you know I admire quality tools. Well, long, long, long before I actually got round to doing woodwork back in the, in the mid-1980s, my father had, had been a woodworker. He was sort of retired from it, as it were. Um, and he gave me a brand new plane, you know, I expressed an interest in woodwork, and he gave me a brand new plane in the box, which I brought over to this country uh, without ever having used, and uh, I tried it when I was building my own house, I tried it on a couple of pieces of softwood, I had no clue what so I didn't sharpen it or anything. Anyway, basically I showed this to people who know what they're talking about, and 
this is this was made in England after the years, you know, in the in the nineteen eighties or the seventies, after the years when the Stanley's quality started going down. It's got a few uh, interesting aspects to it. I, I only actually realized this a few days ago. It's got plastic handles, not wooden handles. But I've kept it and, you know, I, I thought it was just a, a garbage plane. Um, but I was in my storage a week or so ago and I just decided to get this. I saw this thing and I thought, I'm gonna pull this out and give it one more shot. And, and if, if it, it, you know, if it doesn't start to earn its living, it's gone. And so I, 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 I took it completely apart. I'm just going to briefly show you what I did or, or walk you through what I did um, because uh, I think, you know, if there's, there's hope for almost any plane if, if, you, if you treat it right, if you tune it up right. So the first thing, obviously, was take the thing to pieces. So I take my chip breaker, not chip breaker, lever cap there off. I take the the blade and grab my screwdrivers, my handy dandy, fancy, expensive looking screwdriver. And I take these two apart. I polish the back of the plane, set the blade right. In this case, I used, I hand did this with a, a very tough uh, honing guide. Put my bevel on the edge there. I also took the, the, I don't know if you can see, but this edge, which presses up against the back of the blade here, that edge there needs to be, needs to have no faults on the front, otherwise shavings will catch on. So I, I honed that and, 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 and ground it a little bit so that it's, it's on a sort of backward bevel from the tip and uh, the, the tip's nice and clean and that also, cleaned up along this edge here. Making sure that this is darn close to a blade. It's not a sharp blade, but it's darn close to a blade in terms of its, in the consistency of this edge. So I took that, I, I did that. So once those two were done, I could, uh, and you can vastly improve the, the, the performance of, of one of these planes by buying a thicker blade from somewhere like Ron Hoff Tools. The next thing I did was I put it all back together I, it doesn't matter at what point you do this, but I basically put it all back together, put the, put the tool in tension with the leather cap down, and I flattened the bottom. I used a diamond plate, but you can use uh, sandpaper and glass, or granite and glass, granite and sandpaper, or, um, or even uh, just sandpaper on, on a jointed bed or something like that, something that's really nice and flat. Because it was done on a diamond plate, of course, it came up looking really good as well. So you do that, and that, and you make sure you have a perfectly flat surface. So um, actually, a, a straight edge like this isn't accurate enough to show, but basically I want a, a flat surface. Don't ever do this when the blade's in place. But I want a really flat surface. I particularly want it to be flat here and here, and preferably back here as well. You can see there's a little unground area like that that just reduces the friction. And Here's a tip. Beeswax and, uh, and um, mineral spirits or, or any kind of solvent, just keep this on your bench. It makes it so much easier to play. Okay, so the final thing that I did on this, well, not final, um, the paint's in pretty good shape, so I didn't feel any need to restore that. But I wanted to take, I took the frog out. Okay, so these are the two securing screws. You have to loosen those in order to, to adjust your frog. So you can see that if you're gonna adjust your blade with relate, in relation to the mouth, you're gonna to have to actually take the blade out, undo these a little bit, and then use the adjusting mechanism, which is on the back here, which is basically a, there's a little screw that's in the plane body itself and a little plate here. So I take it, took everything off, took the brass um, knob off here. I took this off. You can't take the lever off, but then I flattened the surface on the stone. Can't, well, you can take this screw out. And flat, and, and obviously with the stone down, flatten it. 
But getting all these surfaces nice and shiny really improves it. I couldn't, it was too much work to get, get it, you know, and I was just doing a practice run with this. So I'll probably go back and clean this up some more. And then finally, the engineers among you will remember um, having to grind your own valves and so on in your cars, perhaps. Or am I really dating myself? <laughs> but valve grinding compound, I put it on all the places where the frog touches the, uh, the plane body, put the grinding pump and just, just work it back and forth from side to side until all my faces are close together. And that is a basic tune-up of almost any plane. If you buy one that's in reasonably good shape, um, then uh, that's the basic, basic tune-up. Uh, if you get those things right, I mean, the whole thing is basically about getting a chatter-free perfectly sharp blade right at the right close to the mouth but that's all I did and to be honest I had a Miller's I have a Miller's Falls and I've set it aside I'm going to use this one as my primary number four for a while um because I'm just so pleased that what I always thought was a piece of garbage and that I was keeping largely out of sentimental um attachment is actually a perfectly good plane so I will I will look around and I'll eventually find some uh, new handles for these. Some people call it a tote, but nobody seems to know where the name came from. Um, and uh, I'll replace those and I'll just keep using it until I establish that it's either really good or um, not worth bothering with and letting go. But I was stunned the first shaving I took off of this. As you saw, I, you know, it works perfectly well. You can adjust it nicely. And it's just a crappy old cheap stand. All right, so what else did I, I don't think I've got a lot else. Any questions, comments? I've covered a lot of material. Hey, Paul? Time. I didn't, yes. I do have a question. Yes. You know when you were, you, you know when you were amazing for square back uh, when you were using the small, the small block plane and stuff? And you were taking a little shaving off here and there, and then you measured up and said it doesn't quite fit. Could it have all? I didn't see you put a ruler across the long ways. Could it have also gotten out of square that way and caused the rock? Do you have to check it again? Long that way, yeah. Do you have to check it again that way, or not? Yes. And what I'm seeing here is actually a slight hollow, but I'm I'm sort of hampered a little bit by the light. It's really nice to have natural light to do this up against. Um, but yes, there's a, the, these ends are a little high now. So, yeah, from, um, yeah, I was, you know, if, if I was at home and, you know, the music's on and so on, I'll just take my time. And, and it, it, it usually goes quicker if I'm relaxed than if I'm trying to do a demo. <laughs> sure. I was asking from a, a stru from a philosophy, a standard point, because I didn't see you do it. And it made sense that if you're taking little pieces to get it square, you could accidentally take a little too much in one area or the other. So. That's why I asked. Thank you. Ye yes. Now, if you're being, if you've done the pencil mark thing, and you, and you, and you, it, there is a certain familiarity you get with your tools. You, you can just, you know, you know how to use it at the right angle, and um, just catch that one edge that you need to whilst keep keeping it level. But, but uh, yes, it's very possible. You know, if you, especially if you take, a, use the the block plane to take a. a um, a, a shaving all the way along like this, you know, sometimes it can really help you. The nice, the way it's, I find it really helpful is that if there's a rough or a lot high or low spot, I can, um, I can avoid that. I can stop my playing really easily. I, you know, I'm much closer to it visually if I'm running this big old thing over it. So, yes, it constant checking, constant checking until you get that. The, when I when I learned this in hand tool joinery, uh, it was actually called the perfect edge. <laughs> that was the name of the assignment. But but um, if this is not perfect, I've got a little more work to do on it. But it's pretty close, and you'll find that you know for a lot of work you don't need that absolute um, absolute uh, squareness. You know, if it's a softer piece of wood, um, yeah, there's a little bit of expansion happens with the water in the glue, and uh, but I don't know. I was taught how to get them right, so I'd like to get them right. Hey, Paul, Any other questions? Yeah, Paul. Question: 
Yeah. Um, when you when you flatten the bottom of your plane, did you say it should be under tension with the blade in? Absolutely. Yes. You put the blade in, but you set it further back. Sure. Yeah. But it should be under further tension. Back. Okay. Yes. Yes. So from that point of view. Um, you absolutely should do, whether it's a wooden plane or, or a plane like this, um, you should have it in tension because that's, that's, that's where the flatness needs to be when it's all set up. Yeah, that's a good, good tip. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and again, I've referred to this before, it really helps if you've got a, a permanent marker to do lots of permanent marks and then you can see where you, where you are. Now back in this area here, you don't have to worry about that too much. On many planes, it's corrugated in it anyway, but, which reduces the friction, but the wax reduces the friction beautifully. Just it slides along. All right. Thanks, Paul. answer it? Yeah. Any other questions? If any of you guys have questions about tuning up planes or whatever, don't hesitate to, um, to, to, to uh, contact me. And um, I'd also like to quickly mention that over the next few weeks, we'll be putting up some articles about the Wood 12 exhibit that just got canceled the other day, but I'd, um, I, I, I talked to a few of the previous exhibitors in it. And, I've got a, a couple of articles, so I'll be putting those up on the blog, plus an article about Wood and, and Brian Murphy, who, who is the uh, instigator and, and, and one of the major sponsors for it. And, um, and I, he has said that he's willing to come in and, uh, or not come in, come into our Zoom, Zoom thing and do a presentation in, in January. I'm not sure the exact date, but we will be back in the second and fourth Sundays of January. And I'd just like to wish you all a very, very happy new year. And let's hope that uh, the entire world has a better new, new year than last here, year. Here, here. 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 Thank Thanks, Thanks Paul. Much, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank you guys for, for being here all year round. Hey, it's so Paul. cool to check in with you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Paul. Take care. Thank you.